All right. Let's open our Bibles. Sorry. Can you hear me? No, no, no. Okay. Red, go. We good? No? How about now? Now it's just off. Isn't that cool? Yeah. God doesn't need a mic to speak to us. I love it. He doesn't need a point to save us. No. If I could have you guys please take your Bibles out. Let's open up to Matthew chapter 6 together. We're going to get into the Word in a moment. Just a way of an intro. This is my family, at least a picture of them. My wife, my three kiddos, Shalom, Phineas, and Uriah. We got to take a trip out to Colorado, up to Montana this last summer. Preach there. I had one of those prayers. Lord, can I just stay here to preach? You guys ever go anywhere? You're just like, God, is this your will? Can I stay? Anyways, on vacation, I just, I don't know. How many of you guys have been out west? Have you all been in that awe of like, wow, these mountains are beautiful? You can stare at them for hours at the vastness of just how huge, how beautiful they are. One of the hikes I took, I saw this. They had a multi-billion dollar home just overlooking a um, beautiful range of mountains all by itself. And I was, you know, I'm just asking the question, the people that live here, has the blessing of living here worn off? Are they still in the awe of just how beautiful? It, does this get old for them? Do they still see the birds playing, <laughs> catch the squirrels and the animals and the deer running through the ridges here? Do they catch this stuff? See, sometimes I wonder if we have done the same with prayer, that we've just taken it for granted. It's just something that's always been there. We've gotten so used to it. So my hope and prayer for this session, guys, um, is just that we would be encouraged not to take for granted. I think one of the greatest gifts that we have is being a son of God, and that is prayer. So we're going to take a look at the greatest prayer of the church has had for the last 2,000 years. Thousands of sermons have been preached on it, yet the depth I don't think is ever going to be exhausted. There's going to be six petitions that we see here in Matthew 6 that are absolutely perfect for every single man that's ever lived. The in, uh, initial focus that we're going to look at, there's going to be three requests that we're going to see, and there's going to be three uh, that go to the glory of God for his glory, all about him, and three remaining, that is for our benefit. So, first three are to God, the second three petitions are for man. I think it's the ideal prayer uh, formula. Um, so it's his glory for our wants. Amen? Amen. You know, a lot of people, uh, <clears throat> personally, as, as a pastor, I get a lot of phone calls. You know, a lot of times it's prayer requests. A lot of times it's, it's personal. I'd love to get the phone call. Hey, Pastor, can we pray? Pray for what? That God would just be glorified today. That he would be exalted. That he would be worshipped and honored. That would be so cool. Instead of times, oh, Pastor, I need prayer. We're on the way to the hospital right now. This is going on. Which, absolutely pray for that stuff. Uh, let's get into it, okay? Um, actually, real quick, you guys familiar with Dietrich Bonhoeffer love him. He says, it's not only a pattern for prayer, it's the way Christians must pray in regards to the Lord's Prayer that we're going to look here. So we're going to take a look at verses 5 and 6 here in Matthew chapter 6. And before we go, there's the approach. Okay, he starts off the prayer with our Father. Okay, do we still see that when we come to this passage of scripture, do we see that we're talking to our dad, our heavenly father, because of what Jesus has done for us, we've come into a relationship with the living God. He is our dad, right? Okay? Or have we stared at this too long, okay, that we just forget that he's our dad, that we have a relationship with him, that he is the living God. So as a giving heart was expected, okay, that our heart needs to be engaged in the same way here. So Jesus is going to give us four instructions, okay, when it comes to uh, to prayer to guide us 
into prayer. And first really is on the, the reality of private prayer. So take a look here, okay? We, we need to pray privately before going public. Look at verse five. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, you go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So the Pharisees were known to pray faithfully. Nine, noon, three o'clock, in the synagogues, they're at the temple, everybody could see them saying their prayers. Is there anything wrong with seeking God three times a day, guys? No. Absolutely not. Daniel did it. Daniel was the bomb, right? So, uh, <clears throat> nothing wrong with that. But these Pharisees, they did it to be seen by man. That was the problem. So on their street corner, oh, I can't wait to get to synagogue, God. It's going to be so good to finally get there. You're such a magnificent God. So, do you have a secret place? I want you to answer that personally. Do you have a secret place? As Jesus just told us. This isn't my thoughts on prayer. Okay, I can tell you a lot of things I've read, a lot of scriptures, but we're going to take a look. What does God himself have to say about prayer? Go into your secret place. Well, you better have a secret place, otherwise you're not going to be able to go there. How many of you guys have a secret place? If you don't, jot down in your Bible right here, I need to find my secret place. I need a secret place. Once you have children, you have multiple secret places. <laughs> when I got married, it was the garage for a while. You get home, I just need five minutes, Lord. Me and you need to talk. I need to get my heart right. I need to pray before I go and love on my wife. I want to do it the way you've asked me to do. Now that I have three children, the bathroom's become my secret place. Sometimes I go to the bathroom, now I have to go to the bathroom. I just need my place. But your father, he has a secret place awaiting and he waits to meet you there. In Psalm 91, verse 1, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Think about that. A shadow isn't normally good protection unless you're talking about, you know, being behind the shadow of your big brother, right? Hey, don't mess with me, <laughs> right? And that's what we have. God is there to protect us. Or better yet, in the cases when God's wings are hovering inches above, okay, in that protective mode of the young, as a protective mother eagle will do with her young. That's so cool to think about. But we get to run to that secret place. I encourage you, brothers, run to your secret place, as a wild animal does into a hole or a den to find safety, to find relief when the hunter is after him in, in the chase and the dogs are near. That's why that secret place is so good. This is good. I got to do Bible college in a few places, but one of them was in Austria, up in the Elk Mountains. And years after I graduated, I took back a, 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 a missions team. We went to Poland, to Auschwitz, all over Europe, and we landed back at the school in the summertime. They were putting on a conference. In there, I had a secret place when I was in school. I had my spot. This is where I'd go hang with the Lord. Of course, we can pray anywhere, anytime. It doesn't matter. But there was something special about that spot. And it was a few years since I'd been back to the castle, to the college. In there, I was about to speak. The first morning I'm there, I'm, I'm speaking to uh, the staff that was going to be putting on the conference for all these missionaries from all over the world. I don't know who they are. They're from all over the place. I hadn't had time, got in late, hadn't had time to meet them. This was a morning thing before everybody would start arriving. And I got to my secret spot. And let me tell you what, whoosh, ah, this is just good. But there was something special about that spot because I had prepared a great message to share with all these young servants who had come to serve all these missionaries for the week. The Lord's like, you're not gonna preach that. <laughs> I'm gonna speak to you now. And this is what I want you to share. And as I got up to share, I didn't know what I was talking about. It didn't make any sense to me. It wasn't in my context. But the word the Lord put on my heart, dozens of these young people who had come to serve just began to weep. There had been things going on on campus there that week that I had no idea about in the Lord's book. And I don't know about you guys, but I want to be a man that is being used for the glory of God, 
the purposes of God. I have my ideals, I have things that I want, but when it's all said and done, none of that matters, and I know that to be true. I know only one thing that matters, and that is what God wants, His glory. And I do believe when we're in that place to be still and to receive, we're going to be open to what He leads and asks us to do. You guys ever go into uh, one of those little bathrooms uh, on an airplane? Laboratories, is that what they call them? You guys ever notice that when you go in and you shut the door, the lights get brighter in there? Oh, yeah. Have you noticed that? Or am I the only one? They get brighter. I think that's what it is in the secret place with the Lord. You get to that sweet spot, you know, you close the door and it's like, whoa, things just illuminated. Things just became clear. So get the secret place. I can talk about that forever. We got to move on. Look at verse 7. Uh, and when you pray, Jesus says, don't use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that with they are, or they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, don't be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. So, repeating a prayer is not necessarily vain repetition. You guys know that. You see, both Jesus and Paul repeated petitions. Remember Jesus in the garden. Okay, if there's another way, Father. <laughs> Paul, three times, born in the flesh. Okay, so it's not wrong. Both Jesus and Paul did it. All of us have that routine prayer in our system, right? I think if we can get rid of just the routine, just saying it for <laughs> saying it's sick, okay? Then you can really start to pray. You get rid of, okay, time to move on. Now I can really pray. So he's saying here, don't pray with your mind on hold, with your mouth on automatic, okay? Make sure that your mind is engaged when you're praying. That's what Jesus is asking. And I believe when our minds are engaged, that's when our hearts are sensitized to what the Spirit's doing. It also, isn't it interesting here? Jesus places uh, right before the very prayer that is so often repeated, he says the many words. Don't use this vain reputation, Okay. In the many words, some people's prayers, they need to be cut short on both side, sides and set on fire in the middle. Has ever been to those prayer meetings? On and on and on. And like, get to it, brother. What are you really praying about? What's the point? Okay, yeah, we prayed about Uncle Joe's toe for a half an hour now. Let's move on to the next thing. Um, not that we can't pray for Uncle Joe's toe. But anyways, praying isn't for God's information. That's not the point of prayer. God, let me inform you. And everything's going on because I have my prayer list right here. So how often people start explaining to God all the details as if he didn't know, okay? Or as if it's in a group, okay? Always, okay? Realize who you're talking to when you're praying. Use your mind. You're talking to all-knowing God. He already knows, okay? Let's look at praying God's will. Because Jesus here in verse 9 says, In this manner, okay, catch praying God's will here. In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, and we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So how many of us said this prayer before out loud? Right? So not to be mindlessly repeated. Okay, Jesus is not saying that, but to genuinely be prayed. I get bummed. I don't say this prayer in the church I go to. I know this prayer. I've been in other churches, very traditional. Everybody prays it. And every time I'm in those settings, I always have the thought, do you actually know what you're praying? Because it's really cool. <laughs> or have you said it so many times that you've forgotten what you're actually praying? Right, so this, this is good stuff here. It needs to be genuine. It's not, it's not say versus pray. Okay? Um, he made this abundantly clear in the intro for you and I. The hearts need to be engaged. So we don't hear the disciples asking the Lord to teach them, Hey, Lord, would you teach me to be a better husband? Is that what they were asking? No. They didn't ask. Teach me to be a better dad. Teach me to preach. Teach me to prophesy. Teach me to cast out demons. Teach me how to worship. Teach me how to witness. Teach me 
how to do ministry and how to use these gifts or to start up home fellowships or grow a church or to be relevant in the church. What did they ask him? Teach me to pray. That's why I'm so encouraged, brothers. There's so many of you here. As a man of God, what should be one of those things that we're just like, Lord, I need to learn to what better pray. Yes, you got a question, sir? Yes, I have a question on that. It said, lead us not into temptation. Could you uh, explain that a little bit? Yeah, we'll get there in a second. We'll walk, we're going to go back and walk through all of them real quick. Um, so, uh, if you guys jot down Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it's the context of when the disciples asked Jesus to teach him. What was Jesus doing when they asked him to teach them to pray? Jesus was praying. Okay. How many of you guys would say there's a lack of prayer in the church today, just in general? Yeah. It's one thing I would love to see the church do more of. Okay, I preach a lot. I preach that we should be praying a lot. We have prayer groups. Not a whole lot of people come to prayer groups. It might be the same in your church. I don't know what the deal is. Everybody will show up for everything else. But when it's a prayer meeting, not a whole lot of people show up. What's up with that? Anyways, why the disciples asked is because they saw Jesus praying. I think if the church saw men lifting up holy hands more often, they might be like, hey, husband, why are you doing that? Why are you praying? Can you teach me to pray? Dad, why are you doing that? Why are we praying? Anyways, that was a side note. Why? Uh, it also notes in the scriptures that Jesus prayed often. Okay, what would Jesus do? We ought to be praying. So that is uh, the key, really, I think, to strength, wisdom, leading, instruction, communion, fellowship. Prayer needs to be a part of all of it. So this prayer is only 65 words long, guys. And it takes about 20 seconds to pray. Three to God. Three for us. Check this out. Um, yep. God's name is to be honored and respected. God's kingdom to be completed. God's will to be implemented for our physical needs, our daily bread, for our social needs, for giving and being forgiven, and also for our spiritual needs. Okay, temptation, deliverance. So what I'd like to do is look closely into this text and look at the six elements that we see in this prayer. And the first one that we see is God's person. Okay, and then we're going to see purpose, provision, pardon, protection, and preeminence. But first one, let's look at God's person. Verse 9, it says, our Father. Okay, not omniscient one, though he is. Not Elohim, strong one. Okay, although he is the mighty one. Nor the I am. But what does he tell us to do? Say, Father. You approach him as your dad, your father. And I think that is so important because it puts the rest of our prayer into perspective. Know to whom you're speaking. God is accessible as the most loving human parent. Okay? Father is only used 14 times in the whole of the Old Testament, guys, and 17 times in the sermon, and 70 times in the Gospels. So did God change? No. Okay, but we did. John chapter 1 verse uh, <clears throat> 12 says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God. I get to rub shoulders with a lot of non-believers. And a lot of non-believers believe in prayer. You guys know that? Oh, yeah. A lot of non-believers have seen miracles take place because of prayer. A lot of non-believers, I need you to pray for me. Why me? Because you have a special connection to God. I love when they come and ask for prayer because I got the special connection. I'm nothing special. I'm loved by God Almighty just as much as you are. He wants you to be his kid also. You can have a direct line to him too. Great opportunity to share with us. Nice. So there are only three people on this planet that get to call me Father. Uriah, Phineas, and Shalom. To everyone else, I'm Landon, or Pastor Landon, or Mr. Churchill, or hey, you, you know? Um, but I'm open to the opportunity of adoption, okay? And there would be others who would be able to call me father. But in this, 
I would, I wouldn't change. They would. You guys get it. It doesn't change who God is. The change is in us. So God didn't change. We did. We became his sons. Or maybe you haven't yet. You need to. It's the only thing that matters in this life. Are you able to call God Abba, Daddy, Father? Are you able to pray in this manner? And the only way you can do that is by accepting what Christ has done for you. He alone is Savior, guys. He alone is the way to the Father. And without Him, guys, we can't pray our Father. You know, a lot of people that know this prayer by heart and they do not have a relationship with God. Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, God is in heaven, you are on earth. Let your words be few, okay? Again, we need to remember, in heaven, okay? Don't forget that, okay? There's a balance of intimacy there. He's Father, but he's also God, sovereign. And then it says, hallowed. So holy is your name. In other words, when you come to prayer, this is holy ground, okay? I love it when I'm at a restaurant and I'm thanking the Lord for the food and the waitress comes back with something else. You know, some of you ever have those waitresses, oh, I'm so sick of these Christians, I always pray, and I got a job to get done, they just throw the food, they don't care, you're praying. But I love the ones that actually pause and wait, like there's a reverence there, like we're on holy ground. I wish there was more of that. So, holy, okay, hallowed ground, glory in his holy name, right? First Chronicles 16.10, give thanks in his holy name, First Chronicles 16.35. Praise his holy name, Psalm 30, verse 4, holy ground. So what is God's purpose then? Well, you are either saying your will be done or my will be done. Think about how we pray. I'd encourage you guys. Next time you sit down to pray, write it out. What are you actually praying? Are you praying for your will or for his will? Okay, my will be done. Um, don't like bashing things. I like the Word of God. I have a hard time when churches move away from the Word of God because they want to study something else, do something else. There's a book that's been very popular, one of the best sellers in the church of late, and I read it. And it's encouraging prayer, a lot of good takeaways from it, but it's one of these things. Hey, make a circle. Keep praying into this. You keep praying and praying until God begins to move, Hearts begin to change. You keep praying. I think it's good for you and I, guys, to be in a place of humility. <laughs> it's not about my agenda, what I think is needed, what I think is right. Lord, what is your will? What do you want me to be praying into? Because we can be praying a whole lot of things that has nothing to do with what God wants and what he's doing. Let me tell you what, making circles around thing, I study the cult at length, and every false religion out there has some type of worship in making circles, guys. Nowhere in the Bible. When we look to the scriptures and how we ought to pray, guys, it's looking to God. It's discerning what his will is, praying into his will. So let's talk about his purpose for a moment. See, you want to get your will done, he's going to allow it. Okay. But if we end up in that place, you want to be rejected, he's going to reject you. Do you guys understand that? He's not going to force us to be little robots in that way. So if you want your way, sometimes it ends up happening. Robert Law said this, prayer is a mighty instrument not for getting man's will done in heaven, but for getting God's will done on earth. That's spot on. We have no right to ask God for anything that will dishonor his name, delay his kingdom, or disturb uh, his will on earth. And then if we look at God's provisions in this prayer, verse 11, okay, we're to ask, give us, okay, not give me. Did you guys catch that? It's for us. So the singular pronouns in the Lord's Prayer, there's none of them. This day, okay, so we inserted there that we pray at least daily. Pretty important. Daily bread. Why daily? Because does... Uh, does he have need of us? No. No. But we have need of him. And I love that he brings us in and ties it into our daily bread. So pray daily for the coming day's provision and life's essentials. 
recognizing that all sustenance does come from him. He is our provider. Okay? He is God. Be content with your daily bread. And quit looking at your neighbor's slice. We're pretty good at that, aren't we? Isn't that our whole mindset here in the West? You know, it's all about me. Look what I have. Look what I can do. Oh, they got that. I want that too. We consume. That's all we do. And it's because I think we haven't learned how to pray as believers. This godly contentment the Bible talks about, I think if we learn to rightly pray, we can live that out. And that's great gain for us, brothers. We look to God. He knows what we need. Recognize that all sustenance for life comes from Him. Uh, also, life does not come to us all at once. Okay, tomorrow is not ours, but when it does come, God will supply whatever is needed. The daily bread for that, the daily strength. I know a lot of people are tripping out. This happened, and I don't know what's gonna what that means for tomorrow. I'm tripping out about tomorrow. Um, so our prayer, Lord, give us both bread of heaven and of earth, that which feeds my soul and sustains my body. And then in verse 12, we see God's pardon. Okay? No prayer of mortal man could be complete without the confession of sin. Okay? Have we confess sin lately? Are we real with God? We should always have doubts or debts to own and therefore always need to cry out to God to forgive us. Do we do that on a regular basis? I'm guilty, I don't. I understand the grace of God. I know I'm forgiven because of what Christ has done. It's easy just to keep going on and not take that moment just to pause and say, God, you know what? I'm still sinning. I still need you. I still need Savior. Thank you. You are forgiving. Please forgive me. It's good to do. And time can pass long times where we don't. Again, I think that's where the secret place is needed. Just get alone. Be still with the Lord. Ah. Uh, yeah, could you ever read, Lord, forgive my debts, even if I won't forgive any of my debtors? Could you guys say that? I don't think that would fly. Or forgive me my debts, but don't dare think I'm forgiving my debtors. It, it just it can't fly. You can't get with God and be real with God without your heart being open and exposed and being revealed of who you really are. So what is found in Christianity, which is not found in any other religion, guys, uh, is this reality of forgiveness. I want to share with you guys a story. A question was given at a seminar. There were uh, several different featured uh, prominent Christian theologians that had gathered together. Uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, the brilliant thinker, gifted author, I love the guy. Uh, he got caught up in traffic. He was running late uh, to, uh, to the seminar, and the panel was puzzled over this question, okay? What sets Christianity apart from every other religion? After about an hour, Lewis arrived, and then the question was posed to him, to which he replied, that's simple, the forgiveness of sins. Do you guys get that? That is the only thing that sets Christianity apart from every other religion. Every religion in the world is works-based. You better hope that you've done good enough to be able to get in. Christianity is one like, we can't do it. <laughs> the only thing we can do is cry out for mercy. God, forgive me. Okay? And praise God, he is a forgiving God. Praise him that he was willing to make a sacrifice on our behalf. So I think that's the magnetic draw to Christianity. Unless we're being real in prayer, we're going to miss that truth, that reality. I think this is why we're all here today this afternoon. Okay? We are here in need of forgiveness of sin. And only Christianity can provide that through the blood of Jesus. Look at verse 13. We see God's protection for us. As the last petition asks forgiveness for sins that we've committed, this petition asks for strength not to commit future sins. Okay? Any guys planning on sinning? Well, I went to No Regrets Men's Conference, and I can't wait to leave because I want to go sit. That's just stupid, okay? We don't want to do it, but we're prone to do it, aren't we? And that's why he has taught us to pray in this manner. As the last petition asks for forgiveness of sins that we've committed, this petition is asking strength not to commit the sins that we might do in the future. So lead us not into temptation, testings, but thought 
testings were good for us, right? Okay, but let us not say, Lord, test me. I don't think that's a good prayer to pray. Would you guys agree with me? Lord, test me. I'm doing pretty good. I'm on a med conference high. Let's go for it. No, don't do that, brothers. <laughs> okay? I think this is a prayer of humility. Would you guys agree with me? As we say this, it should be done in truth and humility. So if you think you stand, take heed, least you fall. That's what the Bible says. So it's asking, do not allow us to come under the sway of temptation that will overpower us or cause us to sin. So, but deliver us from the evil one. Who's the evil one? Satan, Satan right? He's a turkey. Uh, Satan is a powerful being, uh, yet he trembles, I believe, at the weakest saint that is on his knees. Amen. Okay. And there are times, guys, we're just overwhelmed. We know, <laughs> we know the enemy's coming at us. What do we do? We fall to our knees, brothers. That's what we do. I just don't get what's going on with my wife. Kid, as a teen, this is rough. My coworker, whatever the situation, get on your knees. Get on your knees. Second part of verse 13, we see the preeminence of God. So this short prayer, okay? I know y'all heard it before, but it's just jam packed. Great reminders for you and I. It ends with this explosion of praise. Is that how you guys end your prayer time? You've gone through it. You've taken what he's laid out. You've looked at the person of God, the purpose of God, his provision, part of protection. And then you get in this place of just being in awe when you're praising him. It's a good place to be in. So the short prayer ends with praise. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Right? So all rule, might, honor, it all belongs to you, God. I think that's a great way to leave prayer because it's the right perspective to have. Oh, God, you're on the throne. You're in control. You're almighty. This has been awesome, okay? Um, so it's good to ascribe those things to him. So when praying, guys, remember the person of God, that he's your father. Then remember the purpose of God, okay? His will, not mine. Then remember the provision of God, our daily bread. Then remember the pardon of God. I'm forgiven, so then I can forgive. Then remember the protection of God from testing and from the evil one. And then I'll always end in praying or praising him for yours is the kingdom. And then wrapping this up, guys, I think it's really important as you look at verses 14 and 15, is praying with a forgiving spirit. Um, the appendix to his prayer here, okay, it expands from verse 12 if you look. He's not teaching that believers earn God's forgiveness. That's not what he's saying here. By forgiving others, that would be contrary to his grace, to his mercy. However, if you truly experience God's forgiveness, then you'll have a readiness to forgive others. I don't know about you guys, but that's something that we struggle with no matter how long you're in the Lord. Think to the day we die. And I think if we're in that place of daily praying and having our heart right, it's going to help with that. Ephesians 4.32, forgiving each other, just as Christ and God forgave you. Colossians 3.13, we're told to bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive just as the Lord forgave you. So true praying is a family affair, isn't it? Our Father. Okay? If my people would pray, we need to be praying. My house should be a house of prayer. Why can we gather together in fellowship? It seems like the thing that gets the least amount of attention is prayer. What did the early church do? Acts 4.42 or 2.42. And they got together for doctrine. They broke bread, communion, and they prayed, guys. So we're given to prayer, to that fellowship together. So if a member of the family... Uh, aren't getting along, how can you claim to have a right relationship with the Father? I love that. So when people fail, don't rub it in, rub it out. Forgive them. Sound good? I want to close. Uh, Spurgeon said this, it may be a blessing to be wrong since it affords us opportunity of judging whether we are indeed the recipients of the pardon which comes from the throne of grace. 
So so how sweet it is, guys, for us to be able to pass on other men's offenses, okay, against ourselves. For in it, I think we really learn the sweetness of what God has pardoned us from. And I think that is one of the main points of prayer, the beauty of prayer. It's bringing us back to that humility, the big picture of what it's really all about. We've got a couple of moments. Let's close in prayer. Father, we are thankful. You haven't left us hanging. Uh, you've given us your Holy Spirit, which we're so thankful for. Uh, the Spirit at time will grow within us. Because uh, we know that we weren't meant for this life. Uh, we're, we've been meant for eternal life with you, relationship with you for all time. And we are so thankful for your grace and mercy that has found us, for what you've done for us, Jesus. That we can call you Father that we can know you, that we can talk to you, that you do care, Father. Um, you care so much about each and every one of us. That you even long to hear from us. I pray that you help us, Lord, to uh, look forward to, to carve out, to prioritize just that secret place of getting away with you, talking with you, hearing from you, God. I know we have a whole lot to say sometimes, and we pray for each man here. And you really teach us to listen well, to hear from you, God. And we thank you for the gift, great gift of prayer. And I pray that these brothers of mine will be encouraged, Lord, in this precious 